a very good evening to all of you joining us today on Wasandam TV and the official YouTube channel of Prime Television at 9 p.m. bringing to you a story that ignites change in the country and around the world. As always, we have joining us today someone very special to talk about something informative and insightful for our audience joining us today. Now, today I have uh, the pleasure of talking to Dr. Lalith Ekanaika, Surgeon, Rear Admiral and former uh, Director General Navy Health Services, consultant and physician of the gastroenterologist, specialist in diving and hyperbaric medicine, the only specialist in Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us today, Doctor. Thank you and good evening all of you and thanks. Thank you. Yes, so let me get right into it. I sure. don't think one hour will be enough. That's and the uh, doctor is a very, you know, he is a jack of all trades. And we have so much to talk about within the next one hour. So let me start off by asking something in relation to what you are doing most of the time. I am, I am, I am a doctor. Yes. I'm a specialist, and as you mentioned, three fields is uh, medicine, hmm. gastroenterology, as well as the diving and hyperbaric medicine, is underwater medicine. So I have three specialties. So I'm busy with my medicine actually, treating people and uh, practicing my specialties and uh, so mostly my my job is to healing people, people. you know, yes. So uh, doctor now gastritis, if I'm yeah. no naming yeah. it properly, yes. uh, it's a very common, yes. you know, symptom and a disease that we see. What do you think, you know, sparks this in people? Actually the gastritis is uh, just a term, you know. Okay. You know, anything in medicine ended up in itis mean inflammation mm. bronchitis gastritis anything mm. you know yeah arthritis you know it is means right okay itis means inflammation mm. so basically gastritis means that it is inflammation of the stomach stomach epithelium mm. but that is a general term but there are so many causes you know people show, call gastritis or gastric they call it you know? yes some people gastric. they say i have gastric you know yeah. That means he has some pain there or discomfort in the chest area or the stomach area. That is mainly because of, because you know in the stomach we have got the hydrochloric acid. It is an essential component mm. to digest the food. Mm. But some, sometimes that hydrochloric acid, it acts on against the own tissues. That is in the stomach tissues. Right. They need called a little bit of inflammation of the stomach epithelium mm. or the stomach cover you know we call it yeah then it causes inflammation and is called gastritis is a just a very simple explanation or simple kind of a thing but is a more complicated kind of thing so yes. over time when the conditions get worse how serious is it for well you start with a simple pain discomfort burping okay. and it has gone to a extent of cancer you know mm. it's a pain it's a you know you can't go by the symptoms degree of pain is totally irrelevant to the degree of the disease inside mm. some people they come up with ex extreme pain they are dying of pain but when you look at it or doing endoscopy or something hardly anything there may be simple gastritis some people they come up with just uh, discomfort they say yes I have small discomfort and uh, then we put the scope we see a uh, cancer My so gosh. you can't go by the symptoms mm. and you are not the best person to judge mm. You have to always, when you have the kind of a pain, anything about this area, you yeah. know, it could be even pain coming from the heart, you know. He as consultants, sometimes it is for us to, very difficult to diagnose or differentiate from the pain from the heart, pain from the stomach. It is extremely important because pain are very similar and pain relieved by the simple treatment. You can buy over the counter in the pharmacy, relieved by the same thing. And if you ignore the pain from the heart, it can kill you, yeah. but not the gastritis. So it is always better, don't judge yourself. Please go to your doctor mm -hmm. and let the doctor decide whether it's the pain coming from your heart or pain coming from your so-called gastritis. And a lot of people have this, you know, they think it's gastritis and they go to the pharmacy and get yeah. a pack of Digene. Yeah, and yeah, they try that's to right. Oh, that's why I'm telling you, over the counter there are so many products, mm. you know. Because sometimes the pain coming from the heart also sometimes get temporary relief by the when you chew tablet, yeah. it can and also simple painkillers. So therefore, even for us, as I said before, sometimes it's very difficult. We go for the next step of investigation. We do the ECG, we do the exercise ECG. Sometimes we go to the extent of angiogram. 
to decide whether it is coming from the heart or from somewhere else mm. because it is not easy are the symptoms similar symptoms are very much similar okay. very much similar but of course the pain coming from the heart of course aggravated or the increased by when you do some kind of exercise for okay. example if you climb a stair or something then of course you tend to get a little bit of pain and is relieved by when you rest but not the gastritis mm. but gastritis of course can cause pain can increase the pain by taking heavy meals but again the heavy meals can cause a pain from the heart as well so it is, it is not easy to differentiate many people we have seen even the people even the, even the people in medical profession sometimes they themselves diagnose yes i have gastritis gastritis and so on but mm. end, of, end of the day it was not the gastritis but the coming from the heart is heart attack People and died. Yeah, and doctor, there is I don't know if it's probably one of the reasons, but people think the main reason for gastritis to occur is for not eating on time. But I'm no, sure there are more no, reasons as well. One of the reasons, well. one of the reasons, yes, mm. is agreed because you know, Mariela, now the stomach has got is a rhythm. You know, yeah. everything in our life there's a system. You no, know? we mm. wake up on a time. You know, sleep in a time. You know, everything there's a rhythm. You know, and the stomach yeah. has also got a rhythm. You know, in the morning, noon, and the evening, like you know. Yeah. tends to produce acid mm. tend to produce the gastric enzymes it is get ready for di to digest the food it expect the food at that time if we delay unnecessarily then of course it that those uh, enzymes and those uh, hydrochloric acid act against their own tissue that can cause gastritis mm. so having frequent small meals is the best way of get rid of your gastritis if you have rather than having big meals on the other hand if you take heavy meals yeah especially fast food when there is mm. no volume there but increased calories yes again the too much of enzymes and the too much of hydrochloric acid get secreted in the stomach and it can it can cause gastritis so it is in between you have to be you must you shall not fast and not not have long term, what do you call the longer period of uh, starvation yeah and also having on the other hand heavy meals also not good you know heavy large meals especially fast food not good so you have to be in between so what how important is the nutrition factor doctor when it comes to yes. someone with gastritis yeah nutrition is of course uh, rather than more than the gastritis marella it is important for our, our health no yeah you need at least 2500 cal calories per day in average adult you know and that has to include with protein carbohydrate sugar and fat and kind of a thing and also the, all the micronutrients yeah. so that is a kind of nutrient ba balanced diet but uh, the gastritis can cause by mostly the, then the meal is heavy heavy means a lot of fat a lot of sugar and also the carbohydrate you know and being in the asian countries we eat a lot of rice it's mm. an extremely good meal mm. it's a good meal but of course the people who don't do much of activities rice is not the best way of filling your stomach because it rice usually stays long hours in your stomach yeah and also the carbohydrate especially the carbohydrates with what you call the all the bakery products mm. that are got very high high co and very sweet very 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 palatable and yeah. increase, <laughs> increase increase in calories mm. so that stays for long time in the stomach so longer the time that stays in the stomach can cause gastritis does this apply to people who do not have or do you do you advise people to have this spaced out meal for yes. people who have the ideally if you have the time yeah. with your with your time with your job or whatever mm. small frequency the best way of get rid of gastritis or at least have your three meals mm. and on the other hand have a good breakfast and the, then the, then the, then your lunch and minimum as possible less in your dinner dinner and also when you have a dinner take your dinner as early as possible and also when you sleep you need to have at least one or two hours or rather at least two hours then your stomach is empty mm -hmm. you drink a little bit of water and sleep yeah don't have this much of food and sleep that is not good and and during sleep you don't do any activities yeah and this thing get digest in your system it take long hours and in the, in the you wake up with severe gastritis in the morning so my personal opinion personal advice is have your dinner as early as possible then at least to give the gap between your dinner and the sleep at least to an hour first doctor over your years of experience do you see any particular age group that gets m the most affected with gastritis yes 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 i would say the people who start working new 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 life you know mm. with a, with a new job with yeah. starting with 25 to 45 okay and the and also the again next peak you can get with the people under tremendous stress family stress or the job stress 
that can help. So even stress plays yes, a key stress role. plays a major role here. Very, very, very big role in gastritis. Yes, stress is very, and also the when you lack of rest, mm -hmm. that can cause. So diet, stress, lack of exercise, lack of rest, ev everything is contributing the gastritis. So doctor, you what would you advise now the younger generation, as you were mentioning the 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 young adults, I would say, heading into the field when they start their new job. What is the advice there? You know, if that age group is all about the hustle and the bustling. How would you advise them to pace out their lifestyle? Well, Mariela, now you need to, when you start your job or when you start your life, you need to improve your life with the, with the job and everything, you know? Yes. So that is a priority anyway. Yeah. And having said that, you need to have a little bit of rest in between. And, then, and also you need to look after health also. Yeah. I mean, it is a balance, you know? Now, being myself is a doctor and specialized in so many fields and I'm doing so many other things. I was in the Navy, stressful, you know, I mm. was in various parts of the country, I served, but still I am looking out to my health. That is important because primary health is very important because health, pain and health, cost and everything no one can bear, you know, especially the agony that you undergo when you fall sick. Mm. So that of course you have to bear, you know, irrespective of the state and your money and everything, status and everything. So pain and everything you need to bear, no? You know, no one else can take your pain. That's no? true. Yeah. Is is this curable, doctor? Which, gastritis. Which yes, it is curable. Hundred percent. Yes. First thing you adjust your lifestyle. That is very important because uh, lifestyle means reduce your stress and also the do exercise, meal on time, and also the certain drugs can cause gastritis. Drugs. Especially, yes. Yes. Painkillers and the. And I would say sometimes off the, over the counter, some people they tend to get they they used to buy mm. certain drugs and for the pain and all yeah. that can cause side effects. Side effects can cause and uh, and also the diet. Mostly the fast food, you know, fast food is very notorious of uh, gastritis because as I said, uh, less volume, high calories, so there is not much material to fight the enzymes and the hydrochloric acid in the stomach that can cause gastritis. Yes. Uh, doctor, now when it comes to a level, you know, when it's beyond critical or coming to criti critical uh, stage, is there still a cure is, or yeah, what do you think yeah, cure, cure is always possible gastritis, but on, on, on the other hand, Mariela, what you need to do is, when you have the pain, anything in this area, yeah. first thing, you're not the best kind of a judge, you know, you're not, the, you're not going to judge yourself. So please go and meet a doctor. Then the doctor is decide whether it comes from the heart or not. Then he probably an average, a simple average doctor, he will go into a, he or she will go into a kind of a specialist in that field. So that is important, right? And uh, to for for in my field, what we diagnose gastritis first we go by the symptoms. Then the other thing is what we do is we'll do what you call the simple straightforward uh, endoscopy, gastroscopy. We put a small camera down there, not the camera actually. We put a small tube down there and it comes in a big screen. Mm. So, and it takes about one minute and it is we do it as a outpatient. So it is very simple, straightforward, very informative kind of a, a test that we perform in any hospital in Sri Lanka. It's very important, get that done and very easily you can get it done. So over the years, Doctor, even technology has played a part. Yeah, yeah. So you would have seen a drastic change yeah, from yeah, yeah. early in the day yeah. to now using, you know, yeah, yeah. something being when, done when, in when, under when, a minute. Yes, Mariela, when I started my training many years ago mm. in India and as well as in Australia, we used to do very kind of robust kind of a material, you know, and the equipment. Yeah. Now, of course, things are pretty easy and very soft and smooth. Yeah. And within one or two minutes, you can you can do endoscopy and from that one minute, you can gather information. I mean enormous information you can either you can diagnose gastritis or not yeah and also there are certain other investigations also along with that you can do scan and also the, the uh, measuring acid level and all the stomach you can do many things yes technology social media you know it's a broad field yes. and it's endless scrolling and even I personally come across on different posts where they say you know this is good for this this food is good for this and sometimes we don't know, so I, don't, I think there is a, we have a better and more credible uh, yes. opinion here. So what do you, what do you um, suggest, doctor? In, in terms of what? Food, food. Yes, I would say the simple and average food is the best. 
right? And uh, there are so many varieties, so many, uh, what you call the specialties and mm. uh, so many material that you can get in food. But I feel that uh, simple food is the most imp that is the, that 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 carries the long way, you know. And uh, mostly the home cook, I would advise, you know, because the most of the fast food uh, uh, they contain a lot of calories, yeah. and they are very palatable, and you 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 tend to eat, you know. But on the other hand, their volume is very less, and their calories seem very high. So therefore, the uh, uh, the gastro the tendency to develop gastritis is very high when you take especially the fast food and of course I'm not I'm not really I mean I'm not uh, critical on that you know mm. I mean you can eat your home cooked food uh, but at the same time whenever you go out with your family of course you enjoy your meal and that is that is life you know rather than just stick into the all the time in the home cooked food, food you know you need to enjoy life also but give that allowance so mostly you go on a kind of balanced diet yeah. With uh, carbohydrate, proteins, sugar and fat and kind of thing and all the nutrients. But uh, on the other hand, uh, if you do the other way, most of the time you eat from the outside as well as the when you, when you even if you have the time to eat in your home cooked food and if you go out and eat something purposefully, okay. then of course the it go, it's not going to work. Ideally, yes, of course, most of the time home cooked food and whenever you go out of course you you are you, are, you have the liberty to eat that well, that's what i do yes. but it's also important doctor that people don't take everything what they see on social media you know, sometimes people say take this juice mix this at home if you have these ingredients this, this is helpful for gastritis but sometimes it might it might not be the best yeah it, no no not at all i mean basically what the, the most of the social media what the people say is what they have tried Exactly. And not, not the scientifically tested, you know. Yes. So therefore, in my personal opinion is home cooked food and be, it's okay no, because in my real in short, we don't use much of sugar at home and, uh, and also the, we don't use much of salt and uh, no, no, not much of fat mm. and home cooked food are basically good, you know. Yeah. So, so that's why in, in, in rather than going to a complicated kind of food pattern, you know, so be it simple. So and means, anyway, a Sri Lankan meal is a very healthy meal. It's a very, red rice, the meal mandung. On the, yeah, yeah. It's on the other hand, Mariela, I, I, I have a small point there. Because we, we tend to eat a lot of carbohydrates. Yes. Because if you get a packet of rice, you know, mm. one third or two thirds or one fourth of, uh, or rather more than that, more yeah. than 60%, 70% of our that food packet is contained of rice. Yeah. It should be the true. other way, in my opinion. Is that because so? most of people and especially young people, they are they are profession or the job is not very strenuous kind of thing, you know. Mm. In the sense that physically they are not active, of course they 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 are they are the stress kind of thing. They are but of course the physically that job is not involved in any kind of physical activity. So therefore, in my opinion, I think uh, less rice and the more vegetables, vegetables and if you eat fish and meat or whatever, you can go with. That. Mm. Yes, and on the other hand, uh, people have a kind of a, uh, a different kind of opinion with regard to eggs, you know. Eggs. Yes. Okay. My personal view is egg is the best animal protein in a in a cost effective way. Because it has got white and the yellow stuff. Mm. And the especially the yellow stuff has got enormous amount of micronutrients. Now for example I know I, the cost of egg is about I don't know about fifty rupees or something. Right? Even that if you divide that micronutrients to small small components, if mm. you buy separately I'm sure it's going to be about 1,000 rupees. So it has got enormous value, especially both white and the yellow stuff in your in, in the eggs. And it has got about uh, 7 grams of protein, okay. right? And you need about uh, about 50 grams per day. So if you do two or three eggs, it's good. But people have fear of getting fear of cholesterol in the yellow stuff has got the cholesterol yolk. Yes, it has got cholesterol. Cholesterol is not a bad thing. It mm. become bad when it above the level. Okay. It is very important component nutrient in our system, especially the small people, small small some uh, children, mm. because the cholesterol is extremely important to develop your brain. So it is it is an essential component. When it goes above, and you start making the clots and in the brain and the heart, and then of course the problem start. So therefore, don't fear of cholesterol, but 
when you have the cholesterol, get your blood test at least for every three months or every six months. And if you have cholesterol, meet your general practitioner or the doctor, and he will prescribe atovastatin or rosuvastatin for a few few weeks. That's about all, because you need to have a balance, no? On the other one thing, you need to take your protein also. And when you take too much of protein, then cholesterol can go up. So how do you make a balance? So my personal view is yes. Get your proteins in a simple way, mm. and also the, test your cholesterol regularly. And if your cholesterol is high, take a small pill for a few weeks and uh, retest it again. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doctor, what about uh, you know physical activity, exercise? Do you recommend good. people to just I do, I do, I to do. Go, I just go for a walk or no. you know some people are really into the gym. There gyming. are two components of physical activities for real. Mm. One thing is a cardio, that is to improve your heart. Mm. Other one is your strength and your shape. Yeah. I feel in personally my my this thing is I do both. Right. <laughs> Walking, swimming, running, everything good. Cycling, mm. everything good for heart. That is called that is that is that is actually that is good for the heart. Okay. Yeah. But if you want to develop your shape mm. and the tone in your body, mm. you need to do a little bit of a passive kind of active kind of exercises. Mm. You know, it's like this. You know, when you do a day-to-day -day home uh, kind of a routine kind of a thing, what you do is a passive. No, from here to if you go to some other some place, you walk. No, you don't run. No, if you run, it become active because people walk. No, but usually for, for their routine thing, they walk. No. They don't run, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So, so you, you need to do something active. Yeah. And also, the when you have when you are right hand, you use your right hand mostly, no, not mm. the left hand. No? And most of weight you carry by right hand. Mm. And you automatically your left side is little weaker than the right side. Mm. So what you do is you do something active, not the passive. So for that, you need to have a little bit of weights and do on a, on a simultaneously do. So it, it it always has science, you know. Yeah. These are not uh, not not things that people do, but they want it. You know, yeah. they are they, there's a science behind that. So, exercise is very important. Both cardio and the physical activities both very important. I do on a regular basis, and people say they have no time this time that you know. But if you can make time, no, I then can I think. Because I, I yes. still I work at least uh, twelve hours a day. I get yeah. up early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, five thirty in the gym, at least two hours. Mm. At least five days a week, mm. and by about eight, nine, third, nine o'clock, I am in the hospital, and I work till late in the evening, till seven o'clock in the evening. Mm. So, people can wait if you, if you really want and to. And you do other things as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I do other things. Because even Mariela, you and yeah. me, everybody in this world has got 24 hours a day, yeah. seven days a week, and mm. 365 in a year. So how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you? Balance, balance and manage your time. That is important, and uh, and because uh, people have, they have time to do various other things. No, mm. they yeah. can. They have time to do shopping. They have time to do go to salons, <laughs> and they have time to do everything. You know, but of course, when you ask for exercise, of course, they say, doctor, yes, I am going to do. You know, I don't have time for time this time. You come up with various reasons not to do the exercises. Yeah, but. My opinion is, it is, has to be a part of your life. When you start doing exercises on a regular basis, when you don't do it, you really miss it, you know. Yeah. Yes, you, you, it is a part of your life. That's what I feel. When I don't do exercise for some reason, at least for two, three days, I feel that something is missing something in my missing. life. So it is very important. So I take, I always give my, myself an example. Whenever pe people meet me, patients, Doctor, you look okay. I said yes, I, I look all right because the reason is, I I I I you manage balance. my I manage yeah. my time. I do everything, and even if you walk into my 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 room in my practice yeah. place, you know, you can see plenty of photographs mm. which I mother we are going to talk my final yes. photography as well. I do that also. I travel a lot and I do photography. I do many things. You know, yes. We're going to get into that, Doctor. Sure. Very soon. Now, another aspect that you're also practicing uh, very deeply is hyperbaric medicine, and yeah. I think you're the only specialist in Sri Lanka. Yes, uh, yeah, it's a very new concept. Yes, so it, 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 maybe no. you could explain to us and walk us through this. It is not Marilla, It is not a new thing. It is a well-established uh, area of medicine mm. in the world, 
and uh, it started with uh, he derived from the diving medicine what is the diving medicine is this you know for example you and me in this room we breathe 20% roughly i would say 20% oxygen 80% nitrogen in one atmosphere under one atmosphere pr pressure if you go 10 meters underwater sea water mm. it become double the pressure you know atmosphere become two bars that means i am talking about a little bit of physics you know yeah. here when you increase your environmental pressure mm. your breathing your your dissolving your oxygen and nitrogen i am talking about very simple simple terms yeah. when you increase your environmental pressure by twice your dissolve of oxygen and nitrogen become twice mm. since oxygen is very active gas that would be a problem but the nitrogen is an inactive gas as long as you are in the bottom of the water is okay but the when you surfacing for example if a diver goes to 20 meters down under water sea water he is breathing he or she breathing to three atmosphere under three atmosphere pressure uh, 20 percent oxygen and 80 percent nitrogen the the dissolve the amount of dissolve yeah. the nitrogen and oxygen in the blood become three times because the pressure is three times there are so many laws you know Boyle's law Charles law and there are so many physics I'm not going to talk about <laughs> each and every law say those are physics actually as long as you are in the bottom is okay but the problem started when you surface it. when you surface your night dissolved in nitrogen unless you give adequate time to from the liquid to become bubbles and through the respiratory system through the lung to yeah. get that out mm. is okay if you don't give adequate time it become a bubbles and it enters your bloodstream and it can go and lodge in your heart you can get a heart attack and if you go and lodge in your brain brain you can a stroke and various things could happen so that is the that's how the people with uh, divers with uh, decompression sickness that that can that can happen and uh, to treat the divers what they tried in many many years ago we put the patient again into the same pressure initial okay. actual we put the with the diver again back to the water right with a team and we allow the patient to breathe 100% oxygen okay then your bubbles dissolve gradually sometimes you need to keep the that particular patient or the diver mm. few hours underwater monitored right. monitored yes so from that they derived what you call the if you give oxygen 100% oxygen instead of 20% what you and me breathe in now you give 100% oxygen under pressure whereas you and me breathing under one pressure one atmosphere you give under more pressure that is about either two bars or three bars 1.4 bars I am just again I am talking about the physics yeah high 100% oxygen under pressure if you breathe it act as a drug for many diseases not only the diving related illnesses but also the many conditions like severe anemia and brain abscesses and uh, uh, chronic osteomyelitis and also especially non-healing diabetic wounds very established treatment in the world and you, you, I mean, no one would like to look, get their leg chopped, no? Just because of chronic yeah, wound. Yeah, and yeah. if you really measure oxygen level, and there's a way of treating those people, mm. they, you put them into a chamber with a high, high oxygen, with 100% oxygen, with a high pressure, then you can save most of the limbs. So there are so many indications. There are about 18 indications. Mm. 18 indications for hyperbaric oxygen treatment and unfortunately of course Sri Lanka of course we don't have that much of sophisticated fully fledged kind of hyperbaric oxygen treatment chamber but of course we do have the chamber in the, in the Navy belongs to Navy and we treat okay. mostly the divers which is not 
treatment for the treatment for the any other medical conditions but of course we can treat mostly the divers when i was in the navy i started treating many divers in the navy we were talking of all things medicine today uh, a topic that is quite new to sri lankans hyperbaric medicine doctor we were talking about you know how you got into it yeah. and all of that do you think it will be you know more in use in the near future for yes, us sri lankans it, yes of course it has to be Mm. and uh, we proposed a kind of a chamber to the minister of health mm. and also the i am involved in the uh, kotalawala defense university hospital to establish in it there and also in the navy although not i am in the navy now anymore but uh, still i am in get in touch with the, those people and they always contact me whenever they want to get a, a kind of expert opinion in the divers of course it is a essential kind of a area of medicine in fact uh, need to be incorporated into our medical curriculum as well yeah and uh, so yes it is it is important because other parts of the world it is not 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 a new thing i mean each and every hospital in big hospital they have got a hyperic chamber uh, chamber and uh, uh, they treat uh, various conditions and uh, it is a part, it is it is a is a is a kind of a Another, another another area of medicine. medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, doctor, if we practice it more, it will be a huge break. Yeah, too, yeah, it, it is a huge break because uh, you know, establish unit going to cost little money. You know, yeah. it is a costly thing. You know, mm. because the those chambers are expensive. Yeah, and uh, definitely. At least one chamber, I, I would say, being a small country here, at least we need one chamber in Sri Lanka in a, attached to a major hospital uh, because it has to be a you can't you can't function chamber in isolation. You know. it has mm. to be a, a kind of a attached to a hospital because it, it always go with the other specialties and yeah. uh, it has to be a, either in colombo in the in, but of course i feel that sri lanka navy is going to have a chamber in near future in a, in a. doctor you are also a specialized diver well i i i do diving not much of diving you know it is a, it is a kind of totally different kind of thing and uh, but mostly i treat the divers doctor you were also mentioning that you know diving is also in your area of expertise so you were saying that you treat uh, divers what is the common you know medical conditions you see in some of them cuz not everything might be successful you know there might be, they might face challenges under water so when you treat them what what are there any common issues that you see well in the sense that the, you know diving is a risk i would say risk profession yes and it's a risky hobby yes and uh, it's a, people do for recreation kind of the, but it's a, you know because uh, we are not fish fishers you know our yes. system is not meant to go underwater yeah so when you go underwater you are you are into totally kind of a it's a new 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 environment, environment. all together it is different so you need to be fully trained mm. and uh, you need to be have some idea with uh, what's going on in a system when you mm. go underwater and uh, you need to be prepared all the time and also the unit to go always with another 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 person we call, we call it buddy because okay. uh, that's how the that is a basic of diving you know and uh, still with all that uh, training expertise and experience and everything still the people come up with uh, what you call the diving related illnesses mostly the decompression illnesses so okay. and uh, people go under water for various reasons maybe the recreational maybe the Uh, they are part of your job and uh, then they come up with what you call the decompression sickness and that is because of in simple terms nitrogen when the process of dissolving nitrogen from the liquid to the gas in the previous process mm-hmm. it become it forms bubbles and bubbles go and lodge in either in various parts of the body either the brain or heart or joints or whatever they wherever and people come up with various things one sometimes people come up with uh, strokes right. paralysis heart attacks sometimes in chest pain in lung damage and there's a there's a variety of kind of uh, symptoms that they yeah. can come up with some people even they can die even yes and uh, it is not uncommon you know I, when i was in the navy i i got uh, my trained in many years ago mm. and after that i converted our what you call the uh, uh, dive chamber to a treatment chamber okay. the chamber what we have got in uh, trincomalee naval base is not meant for treating people mm. it is actually you test the people before they put into the divers you know put into water it is a it's a testing chamber for the navy trained divers navy to train the divers yes so, but uh, since we don't have other facility 
with a calculated risk, you know. I have uh, started treating the patients after my, my, my degree in driving and hyperbaric medicine and I would uh, say that I have treated more than two, three hundred people and now the, there are many trained doctors who are trained in the diving medicine. They are capable of treating divers and still they contact me whenever they come across any problem. And uh, so, and also being an, being an island, uh, Sri Lanka, they, we have got large diving community in the country. And the, uh, so therefore tendency to de develop diving related illnesses are very high. Although it is not, uh, I mean, people don't know much about that, mm. right? And also the, uh, unfortunately, most of uh, average doctor, they don't know how to treat divers because it is not still incorporated in our medical curriculum. And uh, whenever the diver come up with uh, that uh, diver related illness, of course, most of the divers, they know my number, they contact me. Mm. Either they contact me or they contact the Navy. They know that they can treat. Okay. And uh, as a national uh, service, of course, the Navy treat them. Yeah. Navy treat them and, uh, and they have access to the chamber and with the, with the, with the way of getting your permission. And still, we treat them in a, because in my diving practice, diving medicine practice, I would say 99.9% of people not the Navy. It is a civilian we treat because our Navy divers are well trained and they are well disciplined. Yeah. And they know how to. They know what they not to do. They get the training. They yeah. get the training because most of the divers, what I found in Sri Lanka is uh, why they fall into that kind of problem is. Uh, they do which they are not supposed to do underwater, right? And uh, for so there are other do's and don'ts as yes, well. Yes, there are various things, various things. One reason is uh, cost, you know, because mm -hmm. oxygen is very costly thing. Yeah. Sometimes they try to preserve the oxygen. And mm -hmm. uh, they, what you call this, keep breathing and kind of a thing. I, I shall not mention everything each and everything yeah. here. But uh, with the cost thing, cost, I mean, because of a cost, uh, costly and equipment is very cost and uh, oxygen is very costly thing. And also on the other hand, uh, other parts of the world, most of the countries that are diving, divers are highly insured. They are, they are, when you, when you, when you, when you fall into a kind of diving related illness, they need to be transported from the diving area to a nearest chamber. Okay. Everything costly, you know. And also treatment in the chamber is also very costly in other countries. Because uh, when you start treating the divers, it uh, starting from a few hours per day to go at least about sometimes about 20, 30 cycles. That means yeah. about 30, 40 days you yes. have to treat. So the so bills must very, be exceptionally very, very high, expensive. isn't it? Very expensive. Therefore, most of the divers, other parts of the world, they are highly insured. They never get into water without insurance. But in Sri Lanka, it's a little different. Most but of the divers are poor, you know. Most of the divers are very poor, mm -hmm. and uh, they are they are effort and they are risk is not, I would say, recognized properly. Yes. What do you think are some of the issues you see, doctor, in terms of the diving community? Some issues that need to be addressed. Yes, of course. Uh, one thing is they need to understand a little bit of. I mean, they are training because most of the divers are not actually they do diving by by what you call the by by habit you know mm. by by the training from there i would say if a if a father dive is a diver then son is going to die or like Where a generation a generation right? something like, mm. that, like that but otherwise they don't have a kind of a training and also they don't know much about uh, the, the the physiology behind the diving but if you have the proper divers training you, usually that physiology and that what's happening to your system is teached you know that is that is that that taught that is very important. So that diving training is always need to go with a kind of a science background. Science in the center, you need to know a little bit of science of the diving also. Mm. So so it is it is it is the kind of a uh, training and also the uh, you need to understand your physiology behind that. Mm. And also, the, you need to understand the risk behind that. And uh, you need to understand extremely important the limitation of diving. There's a limit yeah. always. So you need to understand where do you stop your dive and... Uh, when to stop. When to stop and 
into service and also the for example if the driver goes underwater for many hours there's a way of coming surfacing you have to always calculate your your dive and everything with your cup dive compute in your hand you know when you're surfacing you need to stop uh, exactly. before surfacing right. underwater at least 10 meters okay. there's a way of dissolving that is a that is a time you give that is that's the time you give to dissolve your nitrogen so divers knows basically basic things are they know but of course i feel that in the in sri lanka divers mostly what they are the what how they fall into kind of a diving related illnesses are lack of their they don't know much about their science medicine is something very important in our society but what happens when we you know incorporate it with something else as well something unusual in an unusual combination photography and medicine doctor you happen to be a master of photography as well it's an unusual combination because you know doctors are sometimes you know into the medicine field and you wouldn't find them you know having the time to ex you know express their creative side as well how did you get into the field of photography as well is it unusual i, I haven't heard I, uh, many uh, doctors you know excelling well 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 i think that uh, medicine is all is also an art you know it though it is science mm. when you're practicing it is become an art you know i i started the uh, photography i would say a few decades ago mm. and uh, when i was schooling i was uh, very good at arts i was the okay. best art student in my school i was studying in the science i was very good at art arts so when i was studying in university of columbia medical faculty and you know medical curriculum is you know it is it is, it is not easy you know you can't do each and everything what you want so i bought my first camera when it was about i would say about 1000 rupees or something right many years ago many and years ago. Uh, it is a, is a very simple camera and uh, then i started taking pictures of my batchmates you know that's so, how it started yeah 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 i was a kind of a photo catcher of okay. my batchmates you know i started taking pictures of my batchmates and uh, never got into wildlife at that time then i went to australia for my postgraduate training with my family and you know australia is a huge country and we travel a lot and from there i started taking other pictures as well on my return back to sri lanka after having my both gastroenterology and diving uh postgraduate uh, qualification and then i started visiting yala national park and uh, then i got hooked into yala national park and also the wildlife photography and uh, i would say my my base is yala when you used to and uh, then i started my wildlife photography and uh, we started with a very simple way with a simple camera and uh, because i never learned wildlife photography from anywhere self taught self taught and i would say in, on the other hand uh, it's a never is a long learning curve i would say never ending learning curve still although i am in a kind of a, a some kind of level of wildlife photography in the world uh, still i am making mistakes still i am learning daily still i am correcting myself daily so a never ending learning curve i would say so that's why i like it and also the on the other hand uh, you know marela in my life i have taken enormous risk in my life I have joined the navy and i was a medical student i was a first medical student enlisted in the, all three services really when the war was started you know there was a bit of a problem for medical people joining the military mm. and they decided to recruit uh, medical students when i was in the third year medical student in the columbia university i decided to join the navy and i was the first medical student in entire military history uh wow. enlisted in all three services and you know as there's huge resistance from my my friends and huge resistance from my parents and uh, you know but uh, still i want to stay in the navy and uh, from the lowest rank and gone to the highest rank and uh, and got qualified in many fields and i i'm very happy with that and as as i said uh, you know i like kind of adventure kind of thing and it is a good package to me package for me and because uh, photography is a kind of adventure especially the wildlife photography is a adventure and also the when you when you when you when you accomplish that adventure you you get rewarded you know yeah, you are getting true. full full satisfaction and also the it is area that you can do your you you can take your risk and do you can do your you can 
do your many new things, mm. which I like uh, in my even for medicine I do new things and uh, for wildlife photography I do a lot of new things and if I have got any success in my wildlife photography is uh, not because of anything but mainly because I do new things mm -hmm. and that's that is the very reason that when people look at especially the judges in other parts of the world mm. when they select pictures and they probably would probably see something different in my pictures and that is the very reason every month like I win something. Yes, just to add that uh, Dr. Lalit is not any ordinary photographer. He has been awarded many international awards for best photography. Uh, I, I have the list. In fact, if I start reading it, I might run out of time. So like I just want to mention that he is an internationally recognized wildlife photographer. Yeah. So that is great news. Yes, that's right. And uh, so that is the reason we are also the wildlife photography is, is, is not a uh, kind of a, I would probably advise in the sense that I would call it it is a although it is an art primarily it is an art yeah although it is maybe a technology it may be a trade it may be a tourism kind of a tool and it may be a conservation kind of a tool but it's still it's a primarily an art mm. and also the whenever I talk about wildlife photography I talk about few P letters first thing is uh, you need to have a passion you know yeah it has to be in your blood, you know, you, it has to come, come from your from system, within. not yeah. because of you have money and you have the access to wildlife parks and you yeah. have vehicles and you have all the facility, but still you cannot become a wildlife photographer. It has to be in your system, you know, and also the next thing is to patience. You need a lot of patience in wildlife photography mm. because wildlife photography is a waiting game. Sometimes uh, you need to stay in one place for a few hours Yeah, with extreme conditions, weather conditions, you know. So you need a lot of patience and also you need to practice this. You need to practice your equipment all the time Yeah. and you need to do new things mm. and then only you can improve your wildlife photography. Another one is your perseverance, it's very important. You must not give up. You lose only when you give up. So you have to always at it, you know. When you do good things, you at it. And also the, you, need to, you need to participate, you are not the deciding body in your own pictures you yeah. participate and peer review is important you you put it in the comp competition and then the other people to judge your mm. judge your pictures and uh, so participation is very important then the other one is uh, power you need a lot of power in the sense that you need to be fit because wildlife photography is not easy thing it's, it's extremely physically demanding demanding thing you need to be good 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 health and good physical strength you know for example, if you spend a lot of money and you go out of the country and go for about 10 day tour and by the end of the third day you are exhausted. Mm. The rest of the day you are in, not in a mood to do wildlife photography. Yeah. You need to have a lot of strength and you need to be physically fit. Mm. And also the you need to be prepared to change, you know. And flexibility. Uh, flexibility in the sense that you need to you need to change mm. because nothing is, is in this world is you know, everything change, you know. Yes. I started my photography from uh, from a uh, simple camera, after that digital, then I am using mirrorless. And also the you need to uh, ready to use new new technology. I am using a lot of drones, pictures, and the and uh, GoPro kind of a thing. Okay. So I am not fear of using new techno new technology. So those things are very important in wildlife photography. Well, doctor, unfortunately time has caught up today and just as much as I would like to continue because like I mentioned at the start of the program one hour will not be enough but however doctor maybe another time we will definitely have you on board to continue because by that time you might have even you know headed on to more different paths as well so today we were in conversation with uh, Dr. Lalit Ekanayaka surgeon and a rear admiral and former director uh, General Navy Health Services consultant, uh, physician, and gastroenterologist, specialist in diving and hyperbaric medicine, the only specialist in Sri Lanka. It has been truly an honor to have you with us 
in our studios and we at ITN want to wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Marilla. And thanks for inviting me and thanks ITN for giving me this opportunity. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's edition of The Spotlight. And I want to invite all of you to join us again next Monday at 9 p.m. on Vasandam TV and the official YouTube channel of Prime Television. And have a safe evening ahead and good night.